Paramedics a leadership position. Many people don't recognize that, but you're leading a team to accomplish care. But we don't usually give leadership skills as much importance as we do medical skills. Leadership's a critical skill, though, that we should spend some time on. <clears throat> Think of a leader. It doesn't have to be someone you personally know. It can be, but George Patton, Martin Luther King Jr., Alexander the Great, Jane Addams, and Bill Belichick are leaders as well. Think of a leader and think of three to four traits that they exhibit that makes them a good leader. Don't describe their personality, but think about which parts of their personality make them a good leader. What are adjectives that describe their leadership skills? I'm Angry Bill and this is Pre-Hospital Wisdom. We understand that medicine's medicine, but pre-hospital providers have special skills, knowledge, and culture that other providers don't have. Let's raise the bar here a little. Do me a quick favor before we really get rolling. Click the like button and subscribe. It helps more than you realize, and I would definitely appreciate it. The leadership trait question relates to a lecture that I occasionally give about leadership. It's specifically about the different academic theories of leadership and how leadership is viewed by sociologists, psychologists, and those kinds of people, rather than how-to skills-based leadership classes. In the lecture, I explained that one of the earliest theories used to explain the process of leadership is what's called the traits approach. In short, it looks at what traits successful leaders have. It should be pointed out that leadership is separate from management and administration. You don't have to be a leader to be a manager. Administrators are not necessarily leaders, and so on. The three roles are separate. That's why leadership is non-positional. The most influential leaders in your organization may be regular line medics. Hell, it could be an EMT. Filling a schedule is management or administration. Helping steer a workplace culture, setting the standard of behavior, that's leadership. Leadership doesn't require a position. Anyway, the traits approach to describing leadership began in the 19th century, but took off in a scholarly sense right after World War II. Right after the war, the United States took detailed retrospective looks at what was done during the war, what was done right, where improvement could be found, and such. They looked at strategic bombing raids, why some men kill and others don't, why some leaders were more successful than others, and dozens of other questions. In 1948, one of the first academic, meaning rigorous and peer-reviewed, pieces was published. Stodgill published a meta-analysis of 124 other studies of leader traits. The main traits he found to be in common in successful leaders were intelligence, alertness to the needs of others, insight into situations, responsibility, initiative, persistence, self-confidence. Just by the way, that seems like a good list for a paramedic. Stodgill updated his meta-analysis in 1974 with an additional 163 studies. The updated traits seem to have been influenced by the 60s. Drive for responsibility and task completion. Vigor and persistence in goal pursuit. Creative problem solving. Stress absorption. Social initiative. Self-confidence. Acceptance of decisional consequences. Toleration of frustration and delay. Capacity for group organization. Yeah. The search for traits is still being continued in more recent studies as well. Compare the two lists. Was intelligence not needed in 1974 as it was in 1948? Of course not. So why is it on one list and not the other? Is it vital for a CEO to be accepting of the consequences of her decisions? One thing that's missing from both lists is being skilled at whatever people you're leading are doing. Is it important to be a good football player in order to be an inspirational, competent football coach? Seriously, think about that one. Do you have to be a good football player to be a good football coach? Why in the name of all that is good and holy is integrity not on either list? The problem is that looking for common traits among skilled leaders is a non-starter. It doesn't work like that. Have you ever met a bad leader with self-confidence? Self-confidence is present in good and bad leaders, just like self-doubt is present in good and bad leaders. There's no sensitivity or specificity to the traits. They're too generalized. In addition, this approach to describing leadership isn't culturally varied. Bear with me, I know EMS folk get glassy-eyed talking about culture, but I mean culture in a micro sense, like the cultural differences between a U.S. fire department and Greenpeace probably being different. 
Does a leader require the exact same traits to lead an infantry platoon in war as a leader starting a homelessness nonprofit? Of course not. Finally, do you think you need different skills to convince a group of subordinates to charge a machine gun nest compared to the skills to convince people to fill out their TPS reports differently? Different situations require different traits. So the attempt to describe leadership as a collection of leader traits hits a brick wall. But in EMS, it seems like we really, really want it to be true. What's the one trait we look for in our leaders? Skilled, experienced paramedic. Eh, I guess it counts as two traits. Granted, skillful paramedic probably includes intelligence, problem-solving abilities, decision-making skills, and other traits, but you don't have to be the fighter pilot with the most kills in order to run the Air Force. An army doesn't make the best tank driver the general. I have no idea whether Dwight Eisenhower could hit the broad side of a barn with a garand, but he led a coalition of soldiers across Europe. Who cares if he could shoot? That wasn't his skill set. Most organizations identify potential leaders early in their careers. Future leaders are even hired separate from line workers. The organization advances their levels of responsibility slowly and trains the shit out of potential leaders at every level with specific leadership and management skills. In many fields, cross-pollination occurs. A manager at a Coca-Cola plant can be hired by General Motors rather than GM being forced to promote from within. Some days I wish we did things like that more in EMS. What's funny is that the future C-suite manager being groomed at Tyson Chicken doesn't have to lead paramedics. Knowing my peers and coworkers, their personalities and remote work sites, their downtime, their stress levels, the expectations of their jobs, their feelings towards authority, it almost seems like you're setting up failure if you don't specifically give a new leader tools, education, training, and mentorship. A newly made supervisor, and I love that term, made, it makes it sound like the mob, should be devouring leadership and management books like he or she was devouring medical books immediately after paramedic school. I don't think most of them are. If you've ever had a skillful leader as a boss in EMS, and amazingly I've had many, remember that it's probably through blind luck or personal talent rather than through a process of development and skill set training. Let me know what you think of this. If you found value from this video, click like and subscribe. One of the most helpful things you could do is share this content with someone you know. Click over here for another video or click over here uh, for the channel page in all videos. Subscribe to another button around here somewhere. I'm Angry Bill. This is Pre-Hospital Wisdom. And until next time, stay safe.